Well, hello, everyone. We are uh, excited, beyond excited. Can you tell that we have this powerful guest with us today? My name is Coach April Ballestero. I am the owner and founder of One Light Ahead, a coaching consulting company, and Mr. Jason Spafford. I always say Spaf as Safford <laughs> with exceptional results now. And we are always addressing the elephant in the room. And we have an amazing guest, Dr. John Harris with us, an executive, uh, actually pastor, uh, a church uh, count consultant, I would say appropriately, and a leadership coach for the churches and other individuals that want to work with him. And he gets to choose the elephant today. What elephant would you like to address, Dr. John Harris? Well, I, I want to talk about the role of... Um emotional intelligence in leadership and, uh, and and specifically my my main focus is in the area of church leadership um, and uh, and what this looks like in the context of church but obviously emotional intelligence is something that's just a kind of a widespread deal um, you see it now in uh, military and education and business and so uh, you know sometimes um, churches are kind of um, you know, late to the party on some some trends, and uh, and so emotional intelligence is, is kind of creeping in there now. But uh, yeah, so I just want to talk about that, and and because there's a big, you know, we we're chatting a little bit before. Um, there's a big impact that uh, church leadership has on the effectiveness of the church. Um, but you know, the bigger picture is just emotional intelligence in leadership period, whether it's business. And some of your viewers are business leaders or education leaders, governmental leaders. And so um, so emotional intelligence is just, uh, it's been a massive, massive uh, thrust for, for, for leadership, especially transformational leadership. And uh, yeah, so anyway, yeah. That's a whole lot of elephants to cover there. <laughs> and I'm gonna set you up for the major questions that are gonna come out of, Jason in just a minute here and yet help it, the audience understand what makes you equipped to really want to dive into this elephant. Yeah, so um, I, uh, I, I've, I've been under a lot of leaders um, growing up. Uh, my dad was a pastor and so watching him lead his church, uh, there, there was that element and, and before I went into ministry myself, um, there were, there were a lot of questions I needed to answer for me. Like I didn't want to go into ministry just because my dad was in ministry. Like that's not a good, you know, motivation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I didn't really feel like that's a, a call. Uh, you know, I don't just follow, you don't follow your parent just because, especially not in this, maybe in other businesses you can, but not, not in this. So uh, I had a lot of questions I need to ask myself. And uh, then I was clear about uh, my particular call and motivation to go into ministry. And so that moved me into other kinds of leaders. Once I left my, once I left home to go to college, I was under another pastor. Then I left college to go to seminary. I was under another pastor. Then I left seminary to go into the military as a chaplain. Then I was under supervisors in the, in the chaplaincy, as well as uh, ministering to troops in, in different squadrons and other um, uh, organizations we have in the Air Force. So I, I actually sat under other commanders. And so one of the roles of chaplains in the military is we advise commanders. And so sitting in commanders meetings, whether it be the squadron commander that might oversee 300 or 400 people or sitting in the meeting of a group commander that might oversee a thousand or 2000 people or sitting in the meeting with the wing commander who oversees the entire base and just watching those different levels of leaders um, the different personalities, different leadership style. I just became a student of leadership. And so not just growing up and developing as a pastor and as a chaplain, but just as, you know, trying to be an effective leader, period. And so uh, so any military um, branch, whether it's Air Force, Army, Navy, whatever, uh, it, it, it's a leadership culture. No matter what rank you have, whether you're enlisted or an officer, every rank has a leadership school <laughs> at that level to prepare you for the next, next level of leadership. And so just coming out of that leadership culture with the military and, and of course, um, you know, you're studying history or so you're studying other leaders in the military, as well as being under the current ones that you're serving and advising. Um, and then coming out, I was in uh, Air Force for nine years. So then coming out of that into the back into the civilian ministry and then working with other other pastors, right, working with other pastors and then consulting 
and consulting other pastors and other church. It's like leadership thing was just the, the deal. And so when uh, emotional intelligence really began to emerge as, as a thing, I started looking at it and seeing, okay, I'm seeing some answers here in emotional intelligence that, um, that, that are, 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 are addressing some of the challenges that I'm, I'm specifically seeing in church leadership, whether it be how, how Christians are leading their volunteer teams of ministries inside the church, all the way up to the, the senior pastor um, or whoever, maybe like an executive pastor, like what I do sometimes um, with, with churches, who, who oversees the staff. And so, so coming to the church leadership space with all of my history with, with leadership, my personal leadership, advising other leaders, um, and then seeing so many gaps in leadership, my own personal gaps in, in leadership, how to, you know, learning how to identify those and, and what to do about them. And then seeing the gaps in the leaders that I was serving, emotional intelligence began to be a nicely packaged way of addressing some of those gaps and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and providing a good framework to coach leaders to move from, from point A to point B and helping them become more effective leaders. So, so that being said, that was kind of a thing off, off over on, on the side. What I began to look at to improve my own leadership was the, the field of transformational leadership. Mm -hmm. And what I saw as transformational leadership, I saw that all the different components about how they inspire people, how they motivate people, how they do you know, individualized um, uh, attention, that's, that's emotional intelligence. I mean, you can, there's not one good transformational leader who by definition leads in transformation who is not exercising emotional intelligence. So I saw EQ, that's what uh, emotional intelligence is, is called for short. I saw EQ over here. I saw transformational leadership over here and this, this leadership style and model. Uh, and then I'm like, how, how can I help church leaders, right? We, we lead in transformation. Everything we're talking about is, is spiritual formation. It's not just trying to get churches to go bigger. It's help people mature spiritually. We want them to grow and get, get be closer to God and, and, and to be able to live out what we're saying in the Bible is for us to live out, to be people of love. Well, right now we're not known for love. Right? It's like something is the matter, right? So, so what, we're not being, we're not, uh, people aren't experiencing that transformation, right? They're not experiencing that transformation. And if they're not experiencing that transformation, then that might mean there's something wrong with the leadership and how they're being led, whether to experience transformation or to experience religion. Um, and so, so your question, that's a long answer to this question of like, how did I get involved with it? What, what may, may, might make? Uh oh, <laughs> the little freeze moment. <laughs> uh, Jason, <laughs> Jason, I know you're lining up a, a question for him as soon as he uh, returns. Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple. So hopefully uh, this is a, a short pause. Um, uh, stay tuned for a station break. <laughs> right. <laughs> and actually that's something that we are working on diligently, right? Yeah. Uh, and are you uh, pausing or are you? Um, I don't know if we can pause. Let's see. Yes. Okay. So John, I'm going to start with an easy softball question for you that our listeners probably would like to uh, know. How does, okay. how does emotional intelligence work? Emotional intelligence is a, there, there are four main components. And of course, depending on, as I've looked at this, uh, some people may have five or six, but ultimately it comes down to four, four main components in there. Um, and so when, when psychologist um, Daniel Goldman in the late nineties, he, he made it popular. He didn't start, he didn't invent it, but he kind of framed it and made it more popular. And he identified these four areas. So when you look at relationships, Right. Most people are, are familiar with IQ and the intelligence quotient, but EQ or emotional quotient or emotional intelligence is really about how it's really about how well we know ourselves and other people and can navigate relationships. And so when you if you just think about, uh, you know, self and others um, and then you think about awareness and management. Right. So those kind of make up the four quadrants. So self awareness and then self-management, and then uh, uh, social awareness and relationship management or 
um, social skills, right? So it's really a, a skill set. How, how aware am I of my thoughts, my attitudes, my emotions, especially as they happen? Uh, how aware am I of my tendencies? Um, and then when I do identify emotions or thoughts that I have, what do I do about them? Okay. And how can I um, uh, point them in, 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 in a direction where it creates positive outcomes in my relationships and, and in my behavior? And so, so many times people may have uh, had a frustrating moment with somebody. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you said some things you didn't, you didn't, you know, intend to say. And you think about it after the fact, right? You know, maybe a, hours later or a day later, and you're thinking, man, I really shouldn't have said that. Well, what are you considering in that moment where you go, I shouldn't have said that? You realize that you damaged a relationship some kind of way that maybe you're, you, you were out of control, we might say. But what if that realization you had a day later, you were able to have in the moment and then control it and, and direct your behavior in a different direction that produce a different outcome? And so, see, leaders who are able to do that kind of thing are, are, are highly, uh, uh, have high relational skills. Uh, that's what we talk about when it comes to emotional intelligence. And so that, that's how it works. Um, what, what's your, your, your emotional IQ, so to speak, and how you, um, how you relate to people? So, so high emotional intelligence enables you to increase your credibility with people. And so if I'm just talking about just relationships across the board, then I can talk about, you know, just your relational credibility. But then if I'm talking to leaders, right, you need credibility as a leader. So how do you build trust? How can people trust you if they don't right now? Um, how can you stop sabotaging yourself? <laughs> how, can you, how can you be aware of how other people perceive you and, and begin to change that perception in a way that builds credibility, that builds trust, and enables you to lead more effectively. And so um, a big piece is that self-awareness piece. It really starts right there. And, um, and so we just talk about those different skills, how to be more self-aware, and then what to do with what you become aware of. And then how to, how to be aware of what's going on with other people. We could call it empathy. And then what to do with what you become aware of. So why is emotional intelligence valuable to a leader? Because um, I'm sure a lot of people in leadership positions uh, kind of look at what you're saying, almost like, you know, th they have to be sensitive and babysit their staff, but mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're presenting it in a way that um, th that doesn't sound like, you know, that's really what it is, but tell me why. Yeah, well, because, yeah, we're, we're definitely not talking about babysitting adults. What we're, we're talking about is um, uh, because oftentimes people have the an inflated view of themselves. I mean, it, it, most of your viewers can probably identify really quickly uh, a person in their life or maybe a leader that they served under who thought they were one way and everybody else in the organization viewed them differently. Mm -hmm. And because their, their self-awareness um, was is off, they really think they are crushing it as a leader, but they're actually crushing their people, <laughs> right? And so uh, Liz Wiseman has a book called The Multipliers, and she talks about people who are, who are diminishers. I mean, no one wakes up in the morning saying, how many people can I diminish this week or, or, or today? They don't, they do it unintentionally. So leaders have blind spots. Leaders have behaviors that might be okay in one context because your family loves you. And so they, they tolerate you different, you know, one way and differently. Uh, but the people at work, they don't love you, right? They're, they're, therefore, <laughs> they're not as forgiving. And so some of the things that one group might allow you to get away with are causing you to lose, lose all kinds of relational points in, in another way. And so where that comes down to dollars is when you are a business owner or you're operating, you're functioning in some kind of context as a boss or supervisor, um, your, your behavior as a leader can have drastic negative effects on your team. And then your team, the, your team performance, it, it, it decreases. Not only are they not performing well or to their best, but they're also not working together because now the anxiety that's in the system created by your dysfunction that you're unaware of, um, is just is just spreading, and oftentimes no one wants to tell the emperor that he has no clothes, and so it, things are just going you know going fine, and so so that's why you have things like a three hundred and sixty degree 
you know, uh, assessment or, or, or just, uh, you know, anonymous surveys and things like that to help with this because, yeah, we're not talking about babysitting your staff, but we're all talking about making sure that you are your best for your staff and that if there's, if there's a perception they have of you that is not true, then uh, you want to know that and you want to fix it. But if there is a perception they have of you that's unhealthy and it is true, then you want to know that and you want to fix it. And so, uh, so that's what it has to do is really building relationships with, with the leader and the leader's team and organization in a way that, that everyone um, uh, loves what they're doing. They love who they're working with, who they're working for. And, and ultimately you're creating a healthy culture. I mean, that, that, that's the, the, I would say the biggest goal of, of why emotional intelligence is important for leaders because you set the temperature for the culture in your organization. And, um, and so you, you can't be the leader who's, who is saying that everyone should be on time and then you're always late, but you don't think it's a problem because you always have a really good excuse, right? It's, it's, you, you always have a really good reason um, and you judge yourself by your motives, um, but you judge everyone else by their actions. Like that, 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 those kinds of gaps create damaging um, leadership images and reputations that, um, that can affect the culture of your organization, your team, and ultimately the job performance of everybody. So yeah, that's why it's, it's way more than just, you know, trying to walk on eggshells and coddle everybody. We're not talking about coddling everybody. We're talking about you being your best self um, and helping your team be their best selves and creating an atmosphere that's healthy and uh, enjoyable and productive. So is, is part of what you're saying in terms of the role of emotional intelligence, um, the uh, self-development of leadership, uh, both at the top within an organization, but also uh, something that then gets modeled by the rest of the organization? Yeah, absolutely. When we talk about a leader should lead by example, we're talking about emotional intelligence. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about closing that gap where there's, where that is actually, I mean, that's what integrity means, right? Integrity comes from the word integer, meaning one, like you're, you're this, what you say is what you do. And so, um, man, I, I would, I would assume most of your listeners would, would also have uh, stories where they're experiencing that do as I say, not as I do kind of person, whether it's a parent, right? That's a leadership role or whether it's a boss or supervisor. And so, uh, so, but transformational leaders, they lead by example. I mean, they inspire other people to be like them because of, 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 of such a, a stellar example that they're leaving, that they're leading. And it's not because they're perfect, right? Because transparency is also part of emotional intelligence. Being able to say, hey guys, this is where I missed it. This is where I've dropped the ball before. And I don't want to see that happen to you. And so what I've learned through my mistakes is I'm sharing it with you so that you can also learn from you, from my mistakes and, 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 and do better. I mean, so that kind of people go, man, that's amazing, right? They, they value that kind of transparency. Well, it takes a person who's secure. It takes a person who is, you know, uh, that, which is self-awareness, self-management, right? Kind of stuff to, to step into those, those roles of, of leadership. So yeah, leading by example, that's an emotional intelligence thing. And that, that's more inspirational than just trying to crack the whip and, um, and, you, and, and treat people as, uh, as tools you know, to build an organization instead of using organization to build people. You know, and just looking at it from the standpoint of being a business owner um, and also being in a leadership position, you, you just mentioned something that I think for our listeners is really important because uh, it's easy to give people the cheerleader approach, but the courage to share your failures and your, your biggest um, weaknesses, mistakes, uh, trials that you've gone through is a lot more difficult uh, for people in a position of power and ownership. And uh, how does that really uh, provide value to an organization from the standpoint of this idea of emotional intelligence? How does that feed a culture positively? Sure. Um, John, let me add one factor to that to give some specific example, because I think it, it, it's a nudge that I want to add to that is mm -hmm. because as, as we address the elephant is the, the, what I'm hearing you say is there's a huge need for mm -hmm. EQ in leadership 
in right. all the areas we serve. And when you've at attacked it, when you ran into resistance, when you've ran into, because what Jason just asked you is how that happens. What have you, could you share an example as you go into that of, of when you've addressed those? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll share even a, a personal example, right? So, um, well, 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 two things. One is uh, I was listening to, I forget his name. He, he, was, uh, he was hired by, um, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the Tim Cook, no, but before Tim Cook, I can't believe I forgot his name, uh, the Apple, Apple guy. Steve Jobs. Um, Steve Jobs. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so Steve Jobs hired him uh, to come in and to change the culture of the organization. And he said, okay, I, I don't mind coming in to do that, but we're going to use my values. So he has a list of 10 values that, that everyone in the learning and things like that. One of his values was tell me the, the mistake you made early. Don't let me have to find out. Okay. Now, one of the things that he, he shifted there is, is the culture was where people would get slammed for making a mistake, which meant that they would cover it up instead of, instead of, instead of admitting it. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, you cover stuff, but it, it's going to come out. It's just going to be worse later on. So he had to create this, this atmosphere where people uh, were comfortable saying, Hey, I made a mistake and the organization surrounded them and said, okay, great. Glad you let us know early. Let's help you fix it. Right, so that we can we can stop the bleeding early, and so and so, he shifted from having a culture of covering up the mistakes because you're afraid of getting you know slammed, to people being quick to identify the mistake because they knew that they, they weren't going to be slammed, they're going to be surrounded, right, and helped. So that's one way that that that, that transparency thing uh, uh, works. Well, on the other hand, let me just give an example from, from a leadership perspective. Um, I, I was on a staff and I, I over, oversaw the staff. And uh, from a self-awareness perspective, I sent out a survey with two questions to all, all 35 people on the staff. I wanted to know, because there's, there's internal self-awareness and external self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Internal self-awareness is, am I aware of my, internally, my, my thoughts, my emotions, all the kind of things. But there's also external self-awareness where am I aware of how, am I, um, do I have an accurate self-assessment of how other people perceive me, right? So I'm like, man, I want to have an accurate perception, uh, 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 assessment of how my team is viewing me. On the one hand, how many of you have, have had those leaders who say, I have an open door policy. Anytime you come, let me know if there's anything you need, if there's any problem, whatever. And then you ask that leader, how many people come use your open door policy? Or well, none. <laughs> well, there's a reason, right? So that was me. That was me. Open door policy. Come, come talk to me. I'm, I'm your, yeah, I'm the boss. I'm leader, but I'm your guy. I'm here. I'm here to support you. Like that was my view of me. I'm that supportive leader. Uh, people weren't coming to that open door, open door policy thing. And so I thought, okay, there, there's a gap here. Um, I wonder why I sent out this survey, right? Two questions I ask in this survey. And this is one of the things I, the tools I give to people when I do a, a uh, an EQ retreat for leaders. One is ask people, not what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses? That That's just not really helpful. What, what are three things I do that help our relationship? What are three things I do that hinder our relationship? My relationship with you, right? So I'm looking for behaviors. Tell me what the behaviors that, that, that add to us being have, having a strong connection. And then what are those negative behaviors that I have that make you go, oh, I just, I just don't like this about him. And, and I got some really, really good feedback. Some of the feedback I got was um, that if, if you bring an idea to me, I'm gonna shoot it down, right? I'm gonna shoot it down and I'm, and, and I'm gonna be critical of your thoughts. I'm gonna be critical of your ideas. And I thought to myself, I don't do that. But but see, when you're when you're trying to get feedback, you can't be defensive. You gotta you gotta hear what people are saying about you because that's their perception for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking to myself, that didn't do that because I'm like, that's not my motive, right? But that's their experience. So I'm okay. So how how is this a thing, right? Mm -hmm. How is this a thing? So I learned that. Um, 
when people come with me with their ideas, I'm, I'm a strategic thinker. So I jump to how is this going to work? If there are holes in it, I want to identify the holes, but I want to also help you plug them in. Right. And so, so, but, but people were not coming to me with their ideas because uh, the perception was you need to have your thing nicely packaged a flawless presentation before you even come to me with your idea. Cause if not, I'm going to pick it apart from my view. I'm actually trying to help you think through some things you might not have thought through. So, so this is what I've learned. This is what I've learned. I've learned to say, people come with an idea, say, Hey, this is a great idea, right? Affirm it right out the gate. Cause I wasn't doing that. I'm like, what did you think about this? How much money is that going to cost? Well, what about this? What about, you know, and, and people are, they feel deflated, <laughs> right? I wasn't trying to do that, but that's what was happening. And so, uh, so I learned to say, man, I love this idea. I love this about it. I love this. I, I see the potential. Do you mind me asking you a few questions that I think can help you take this further? Right? So I had to frame my question in a positive light because if not, they were framing it as I'm shooting it down and I'm being critical. And then over time, that whole thing turned around where people loved coming to me because they knew I was going to support them with my ideas, but my ideas came out as questions, right? So they began to see it, be, began to see it as, as support. Well, man, a, after I learned that this was happening, I had to, had to the, the, the big shift was I had to make a statement to the whole staff. I said, hey guys, this, this, is, this is where I learned. I learned that, it, uh, that my, my view of myself is not the same view you had of me. And I want to apologize for that. On the one hand, I'm saying I'm open hearted. Come talk to me. On the other hand, I see I'm, I'm being hard and, and uh, with, with your ideas. And part of that is because I want your idea to work. If it's not going to work, I want to think through with you how to make it work. But I realized that my questioning was causing you to feel defeated. Um, and so, and I, I don't want to do that. You all are a great team. You have brilliant ideas. I love working with you all. And that's an area where there was a gap for me. And I apologize for that. I really want to be a supportive of you. And I've noticed that I need to ask my questions differently so that it comes across as more supportive instead of, instead of being critical, man, over time, folks started flooding, flooding. People were referring people to, to, to me. If they had an idea, hey, you need to run it past Pastor John because he'll, he'll help you He'll help you launch it. And when he helps you launch it, it's going to be tight, <laughs> right? Um, uh, another, another thing was I, I went in one time and I said, I asked one of the administ administrative support. I said, why are these stacks of papers on this desk right here? Okay. And she immediately went to covering for herself. Well, I, I only had it there just for a second because I was working on this and I just put it there and, and her reaction, right? This is emotional intelligence. Her reaction showed me she was perceiving something completely different than what I, what I was thinking. And I said, I said, why, why are you, okay. It seemed like you are afraid of something. <laughs> what, what are you afraid of? Well, you, you seem like you're, you're criticizing me for putting the, these, these things here. I said, no, no, no. The reason why I asked you why you're, you have these stacks of paper, these reams of paper on this, I'm wondering if you need more storage space. Mm. <laughs> right? um, do, you, um, do you need, or am I gonna see more reams of paper stacking up here? Do you need more storage space? Do you need more, do we need to buy a file cabinet? She was like, oh, okay. No, I just put it there for a second. Oh, okay. Right. But see, I had to lean into that though. I had to ask that, so that EQ, this was a social awareness piece. I had to see what was happening with her and go, okay, this is not, this was not my goal. And then be able in the moment to, to, to shift it around and say, okay, what, what just happened here? How can, how can I fix it? How can I clarify what's going on? So, so yeah. Sorry to cut you off, but um, it, the, 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 the real follow-up question I have from this is, uh, for people who don't know their own emo emotional intelligence yet, they haven't gone through any exercises, um, but they want to improve their organizations. Um, one of the things that I'm understanding out of this is it's, it's um, listening more, uh, but also recognizing the role that fear plays within us as well as our organization. So being aware of that fear. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the question I have for you 
is in terms of how does a leader um, who otherwise may look at themselves as being um, infallible uh, really do the introspection to understand uh, the, the latent fears that may really be um, uh, something that other people are aware of just in the way that they're operating on a day-to-day -day basis and how they're modeling to their organizations. Because it sounds to me like that lack of intelligence allows fear to be a major um, aspect of how your day-to-day -day, um, behavior is modeled. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would, uh, you know, Patrick Lencioni uh, was talking about the five dysfunctions of a team. And one of those is the, is the, the lack of trust, right? How they handle trust. And, and another one is conflict, uh, avoiding conflict. Well, why do people avoid conflict? There's a fear, a fear of what? A fear of something, whether it's conflict not done well, a fear of relationships being destroyed or, you know, and so that, that avoidance of conflict and that trust, that trust factor, man, fear and anxiety is definitely a, a part of that. So for the leader who, who, who views himself as, um, as uh, you know, leader of the year, <laughs> you know, leader extraordinaire, um, sometimes it takes a crisis to crack that, that external veneer. Sometimes it takes hitting a wall. Sometimes it takes something drastic because they, they overlook all of the, 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 um, the symptoms of, of problems. Um, sometimes, sometimes your staff, if they don't feel comfortable telling you directly, they're, they're gonna do some passive aggressive stuff. And, and instead of going, wait, this person was a really sharp person and now I'm seeing this crazy behavior, Instead, you know, I wonder what, what happened. Instead of doing that, because they're infallible, there's nothing wrong with them. So, so them being the issue is not even on the table, right? So then their focus is always on the other person's behavior. And so they go straight to criticism and trying to fix the other person and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, so that's why I'm saying sometimes it takes a crisis and, and, or, um, or, or bringing in a consultant, you know, someone who doesn't have who's not a part of the system and who can kind of objectively uh, pull that person aside and say, Hey, you got a problem. Wow. I, I, you, you asked me to come and sit in your staff meeting and kind of just pick up on what's happening. I'm saying right now, your whole team is afraid of you. That's why that's <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, I, I was listening to another, I think it was uh, Patrick Lencioni. So we talked about a, a leader who did a, who did a 360 uh, uh, thing. And uh, so he was evaluating the, the uh, results of the 360 evaluation. So, okay, it's now time for us to come in, in a meeting and talk about this thing. All the comments were, were uh, anonymous. And so, so he sits in the meeting to talk about, you know, with that team to talk about what's going on. Of course, the leader is there and no one says anything. No one wants to raise their hand to talk about anything. And so he's like, okay, first of all, I'm looking at the results. We have a pro we got to talk about it. So in a lot of cases, people are just so afraid of losing their job, so afraid of whatever. And um, uh, so I would say to the person who thinks that they're infallible, um, if you're married, try talking to your spouse, mm -hmm. or if you have kids, try talking to your kids. I think that's a good place to start. That's a little more safe than the business side. OK, because because when, when a leader has that view, they're trying to protect something. They're trying to protect their image because the, the ironic thing is they're also afraid that <laughs> they're afraid of what will happen if they don't look like they're all put together. They're afraid of losing credibility. And the, the ironic thing about that is they've already lost it because they believe this self-deception. Um, and so you got it. So it's either you listen to a conversation like this and go, I think I'm flawless. And I think they might be talking about me. I might need to make that extra step to get an accurate self-assessment here. Let me check with my family. Let me check with some friends of mine who are close and say, hey, I, I know we're friends. I know we can talk, but I need you to be honest with me. What are some things that hurt our, our relationship, right? Or, or maybe some people even in the organization who, who, um, who might even be peers, where if they don't, they're more comfortable saying something negative without feeling like there's going to be some kind of retribution and, you know, but to, you got to find somebody you got to find and start somewhere. Um, and part of 
what I would say is um, would be a massive step is just stepping out of that I'm infallible and start being curious as to how you are fallible. So making those initial inquiries is a big step for that person to say there's some might be might be something wrong here. I want to start finding out what that is. And that's their journey of self-awareness right there. And they can just, it can just move on. So, so start with family, start with people who you know love you no matter what, right? And they see, they see your backside anyway. You know, those hospital gowns, right? You try, to, you try to wrap, no matter how you work, a hospital gown, you know, if somebody's in that room long enough, they're gonna see your backside, right? So, so people who are in a relationship with you who've seen your backside and who you can you can hear. Um, honest feedback from them. So start in that safer place and then kind of begin to move into maybe business or friendships or things like that. So that's how I would say, but you got to start somewhere. But sometimes it's, it's they well, don't do it and you hit a wall and then you have to do it. But then there's, there's, all, there's all this damage now that could have been avoided. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the final question I have for you is that for a lot of leaders of organizations and, and people who have reached a certain amount of material uh, success, uh, the difficulty, you know, obviously is that uh, they believe that people respect them based on uh, their material success, what they have. I mean, you have so many people that based on the car they drive, the watch they wear, uh, you know, the uh, person that they have in, uh, they're in a relationship with, they look at these things uh, that they've accumulated success and people respect them for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you're now saying is that uh, the role of emotional intelligence is that you get underneath the surface of that to whether or not people really respect you at all or they're simply following you or doing what you say because it's in their best interest, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for their, you know, uh, job security, but yeah. in terms of their performance, um, it's really not stellar performance. So how do you get someone uh, who has achieved a certain amount of material success to understand that the real breakthrough that they're missing is that the lack of authenticity that material success provides is also the lack of performance that they're really getting from other people as well as relationships mm -hmm. uh, because of their focus on something that uh, truthfully, ironically enough, is ephemeral, even though it's, it's material, uh, because those things go away. Where the underlying spirituality and, and emotional connection that you've you know brought out in this conversation is far more lasting and sustainable if mm -hmm. you're uh, uh, addressing it properly. Yeah, I, I think um, a lot of that would have to do with um, what kind of impact that leader wants to make. Uh, do you just want to? Uh, use your employees to create, um, to help your organization just create results? Or do you actually want to develop people? And so a big, a big philosophical change would have to be shifting from focusing on results to focusing on people. Mm -hmm. If you're just focusing on results, you're going to use them as tools. And it doesn't matter if they are inspired by you or not, as long as they're doing the job. Uh, one of a military commander who I was really good friends with, he says, he says, you know, in military, when we, we have rank on our on our shoulders, and it doesn't matter if you like me or not. <laughs> when I give you a command, you better salute and, and, and get it done. And he says, he says, those who lead volunteers, that's where you can tell if a person is a good leader or not. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have to follow you, they want to follow you. And so you have to lead with inspiration, with motivation with integrity, with credibility. In the military, you don't. And, and I would say other organizations as well, um, where people are leading with, with, with transactional leadership, right? If you want a promotion, you better get the job done. If you want a raise, you better get the job done. So you work hard to get this over here. And so that's that that material kind of thing. But but a transformation leader says, I, I you're, you're not gonna be your best just in a transactional kind of thing, right? 
you'll be your best if I help you understand how your life is connecting with the overall impact we're making in the world, right? If I help you see meaning, and, and then I, I help, I, you know, value you as an individual person. I, I get that you just lost somebody in your family. So take your time to grieve and, and do that because I care about you. And I'm going to send a fl some flowers to the funeral. And I might even pop up, you know, as opposed to saying, man, I, okay, I get that their, their loved one passed away, but, but who's going to, right? Who's going to be doing, we still got a, a mission to accomplish. It's like, nah, that's, that's, that, that's the wrong kind of leadership. So it, it really begins with that, that philosophical change with, am I just gonna focus on results or if I'm gonna focus on people? Another adage I learned in military is if you, if you take care of your people, your people will take care of the mission. And, and that's, that's more along the lines of, of emotional intelligence, right? And so as a chaplain, that's one of the things I advise military commanders on. I remember we had, we had a unit and we had, uh, we had two suicides in that particular unit. Um, it was about uh, 600 people. And I was talking with the commander about how to work through this with the folks who have experienced tremendous loss. I mean, this, this was their buddy, you know, including the people who found the individual because they lived together. And he's like, Chaplain, I gotta get these planes, I gotta keep these planes in the air. I said, I said, well, sir, uh, every pilot, because this was a, a the group was their maintainers that they fixed the aircraft, right? I said, sir, every pilot who flies these aircraft are, are counting on every maintainer to be paying attention. <laughs> and, to, and to be focused, right, mm -hmm. when that aircraft goes in the air. So while you're saying you want to get these planes in the air, I want to make sure no plane crashes and hits the ground because someone wasn't paying attention. We need to take care of our people. So those are the kind of, of, of things I had to inter interject and like, hey, I understand the mission, but there's a place for empathy in, in, in how we're leading. And if, we, if you shortcut this over here, man, all we need is one wrench to get, you know, locked up in an in a engine and now we got a whole nother situation. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So um, on that point, because I, I think uh, uh, in the respect for time and to, let, to allow you to uh, uh, share um, a little bit more about yourself. So would you tie emotional intelligence to equity, which is a word that we haven't really used, you know, in, in this conversation? But it, it sounds like what you're doing when you uh, use emotional intelligence in leadership is you're getting more people to buy in to the overall vision and the organization and, and take ownership along with you. So you're, you're in, in a sense, presenting equity uh, to your team um, for everybody to buy into a bigger uh, opportunity. Yeah, and, and, and to buy into the leader. You know, uh, there, there's when, when people know you care about them, man, that's massive, right? They, they won't be that employee that, that's cutting corners just to make it by, right? They'll be that person that says, man, I know who I'm working with and working for, and I really want this to go well, you know? Um, and so um, you, you, th there's, there's kind of some hypocrisy there if you're trying to get people to, you know, inspire to move an organization forward, and and because of the mission of the organization and the impact the organization organization is going to have, but then internally you're mistreating people, right? Like there's 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 an organizational hypocrisy there. There's a gap. So you you have got to demonstrate the values inside the organization and how you lead. If people, if you expect people to buy into the values of the organization themselves. So they're not just buying into the mission of the organization. They're all, they also have to buy into you, mm -hmm. you know? And so like the, the example I gave of, of someone um, passing away, I mean, that's like a real example. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, you know, when, when you have a person who, a leader and the people who are following them don't feel like they care about them, they're, they're gonna cut corners and just make sure that they get home on time, right? Or, or, or leave. But when you have a person, uh, you know, that person cares about you, right? That person who, who gave you extra time off to be with your family, then when you come back to work, you're busting your butt because you know, it's not just a job. Like somebody cared about you and now you're demonstrating care back by making sure that you're doing your, what, you, what you're supposed to do. But you're also inspired, you know, to really be a part of something, of something bigger if that leader is, is demonstrating that, right? Again, leading by inspiration and motivation is way different than leading by transaction, 
you know, and promotions and pay raises. Um, and so when you, when you lead, when you lead people and they know that you care about them, uh, it's just, and that's one of the things that Gary Vee is really big on, right? When it comes to empathy, I mean, knowing his, all his employees, what it is that they like, right? Um, and so, you know, just one, one tidbit, when I'm, when I'm leading a team, I might say, man, okay, I want to give something tangible as a result to let my team members know that they did great. So I'm going to buy about 10 Starbucks gift cards and I'm going to have them in my pocket. And anytime a, a person on the staff does something great, I'm going to reward them with a Starbucks gift card in front of the whole staff. That sounds like a great idea. Um, but then when you reward that one person with a Starbucks gift card, what they know is you don't know they don't like Starbucks. <laughs> like, like, like you thought you, you, you just did this great leadership thing, right? And you just let the entire, and everyone, and everyone else knows that they don't like Starbucks. Yeah. Right. But on the other hand, if you say, you know what, here's a Jamba juice. Cause I know you love the, the mangoes, whatever. Right. Or this other person you go, I know you love arts and crafts. Here's a gift card to Michael's, right. It's a personalized gift. So it's not just some blanket thing you're doing because it's a good leadership thing to do. You, you, you get a, you surprise a person with a Michael's gift card. They, they, that's special. <laughs> It might just be ten dollars, but the fact that you know that they like Michaels, and this person likes Jamba Juice, and this other person likes Starbucks, and this person likes—I mean, they're like this person. We're not just—we're not just, a, 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 you know, tools. We're people to this leader. Man, they're gonna—they're gonna get the best out of me, man. That's that—that—that's what I mean by by inspirational. And so, you don't even think about those kind of things if you're thinking transaction, if you're thinking results everything, all that kind of stuff. So um, the person who takes care of their team, uh, they're, they're gonna get the team's best and they're gonna be able to develop the team. Um, so, yeah. So Jason, I believe you have drilled down uh, quite well into the elephant and uh, John, I'd love for you to share, to wrap us up, uh, how people get in, in touch with you, you know, and what, uh, again, makes you so passionate about this elephant and why you're on a mission to honor people with this um, awareness. Yeah, one of the things that I will say makes me so passionate about it is I've seen the difference. I, I think I'm a good guy, mm -hmm. right? And because I think I'm a good guy, I want everyone to believe I'm a good guy. If you don't believe I'm a good guy and I believe I'm a good guy, we, we got to solve that. Cause I want you to know I'm a good guy. <laughs> right? So, and so in my own leadership where I saw the gap between how I intended to lead and the message I wanted to communicate in how I lead was what people were experiencing. And I thought, Oh my gosh, that was, that is bad. That is bad. Let me, now that I know I can fix it. So I've seen that just myself. And so I've seen a lot of, a lot of church teams. I've seen a lot of military teams. I mean, really suffer because the, the leader's blind spot and no one could, the leader wasn't open. No one could tell the leader. And they went from one Air Force base to another Air Force base. And it was just, it was just bad. And it's fixable. That's my passion. It, it's fixable. If you become aware of these, of these things, you can tr absolutely transform your leadership. The, your trust goes through the roof. Credibility goes through the roof. Team culture changes, um, unity changes, productivity changes, job satisfaction change. I mean, they're just so much just with, with emotional intelligence and because that is fixable. The thing about IQ, if, if, you, if you're born with low IQ, ain't nothing you can do about that. If you're born with a high IQ, then, that, then it is what it is. But so that, that, that's, that's, that's uh, it's static, it's not changeable, right? With emotional intelligence, it is changeable. That's why I love it so much. That's why I'm passionate about it. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in coaching other people. Where it's actual hands-on results, even after one talk, right? One talk, it's, it's, it's just, you can see uh, immediate changes. So uh, so my, my website is uh, drjohnharris.com. And um, so people can go on there, they, they can check it out. Or they can just email me directly if you want to set up a time or I can send you a, a Calendly link and we can chat and, and see uh, how, I can, how I can serve you or your team. And we, we, maybe it's a, a one-on-one -on -one coaching call, coaching for emotional intelligence, or maybe we do a virtual or even in-person, depending on where you're at, uh, a leadership uh, retreat with emotional intelligence, a uh, half day, full day, two days, whatever. Um, and uh, we can just, we can connect that way. So that's, that's john at drharris.com, Dr. right? That's my email, john at 
drjohnharris.com, or they can just check out my website and um, peruse on that a little bit and, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, set up an appointment that way, or just on my Facebook, just, you know, message me on Facebook, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, and quite a following there as well, sir. Yeah, uh, thank absolutely. you for taking the time to join us. Thank you, uh, Jason. Thank you anything else you want to share with our audience before we wrap up our another amazing episode of Addressing the Elephant in the Room? John, you were a great guest. We were delighted to have you. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. I look forward to uh, all your great success. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me, both you, uh, Jason and April. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Having a great day, everyone.